Dave, welcome. Yeah, pleasure to be here. So we have talked about sense making a lot on the channel. Uh, we're currently doing a series called The State of Sense Making. And you are, we called you the sense making OG. Is that fair enough? I mean, you, you've been talking about this for an awfully long time. Yes, I mean, you know, people like Vike and Irving come before me, but the, and, and Klein, right? And I know Brenda and Gary really well. But I think, yeah, I've created a distinct school of sense making, I think, and that's been acknowledged in the literature. Mm. Yeah, and I'd love to, to get a little bit of this history and kind of contextualize it, because it was something that we, um, we find very useful as a, as a term. It sort of feels to me like no other word quite encapsulates it. So I'd love to hear why you think the word sense making or the concept sense making is important. It's how you define it, and it's interesting whether you have a hyphen or not is very significant in certain circles. I use it with a hyphen, Carl doesn't, right? I define sense making as how can you make sense of the world so that you can act in it. And with that com comes a concept of sufficiency, because you can never know all you need to know, but how do you know when you know enough? So there's that very action focus in it. And that comes from my background in building and designing decision support systems because, and that was at a strategic level. The naturalizing element is absolutely vital. That's in philosophy, which is my main background. Um, means to root what you do in the natural sciences. So what I do is we actually use natural sciences in what's called an enabling constraint in complexity. Um, so you basically say there's things we know about human beings. So for example, we know that nobody scans more than three or 4% available data. We know that you won't see you things that you don't expect to see. We know that systems have certain properties. So those act as what are sometimes called counterfactual statements. It means you can't break them. So you have to develop methods and tools within those boundaries. That also significantly reduces uncertainty. Um, I mean, it's, it's also an approach called abduction rather than induction. And the danger with inductive approaches or case-based approaches is aside from the common thing of partial selection of cases, incomplete selection of cases, um, confusion of correlation with causation, which is an endemic problem in social and management science. Your fundamental problem is if everything's changing, there's no point in using cases from the past to decide what you do now anyway. So natural science gives us a level of certainty within which we can operate. And I think that's key to the approach on sense making. Mm. And you've already used a few concepts that I'd love to unpack, and because I think they're really beneficial and helpful for people. You mentioned uh, enabling constraints, and I think there's a distinction between enabling constraints and a different kind of constraint. Yeah, enabling constraints and governing constraints. I mean, Alicia Gerardo is the best on this. Um, she really gets it. Um, so a governing constraint, if you, if you want a really simple way, a governing constraint contains an enabling constraint connects. Now, that's not completely true, all right, but it's a good way of getting the point across. So if something is contained, you know its boundaries. And if you go into systems thinking, you'll find they all define systems as having boundaries. And that's one of the ways you know you're talking with somebody from systems thinking, not complexity. In complexity, we know that connectivity matters and systems may or may not have boundaries, but they're connected. So that, that's a key distinction. Yeah? And their boundaries can be indeterminate. The other point is what an enabling constraint does, sorry about the academic language here, it disturbs the equiprobability of the system. So if you don't have constraints, everything is equally probable, which means no evolution happens. So without constraints, you don't get evolution. Yeah? The issue is what type of constraints and their fluidity and a whole body of stuff around that. Could you describe what an enabling constraint is? Well, a good example is Wikipedia. Um, somebody told me I had to go in and investigate Wikipedia many years ago now, and I became an addict, all right? Um, Wikipedia has no mechanism to adjudicate content. That's actually its great strength. It's why it succeeds and it grows. The constraints are on behavior. So if you edit war, you'll get blocked for a bit. If you carry on edit war, you'll get permanently blocked. If you use our Honeman arguments, or if you don't base your stuff on third party reliable sources, you'll get blocked. So effectively, behavior is an enabling constraint. And what that does is it forces you to work with people you fundamentally disagree with. I mean, I monitor a lot of far-right sites in the UK and the US and some of the creationist nonsense. Mm. 
But if I'm honest about it, I've got some quite good friends on the far right on Wikipedia because they play by the rules and they know how it works. Whereas other people who just jump in and say they're right, yeah, it, it doesn't work that way. So I think Wikipedia is a really good example of behavior being used as an enabling constraint, which means that content can be relied on. Yeah? And that's working indirectly, not directly, which is what you tend to do in complexity anyway. And in a moment we'll go into some of your frameworks. The Kinefin framework is the one that I think many people will be aware of and I think is hugely influential on many of the people we've spoken to on the channel over the last three years or so. So maybe it might be good to just sketch out what that looks like. So there are three basic systems in nature, right? There's, there's ordered, complex and chaotic. Now, just to be clear, this is an emerging field. So some people will use chaos in a very different way from the way I'm using it. It's not that one of us is right or one of them is wrong, it's just the language hasn't settled yet. So order is a system with such a high level of constraint that you've got a degree, you've got prediction. The same thing will happen again the same way twice. Chaos in my language is a... Can you give an example of an ordered system? Driving on the left, driving on the right, yeah. Um, yeah, expert knowledge is actually generally an ordered system. I, an expert, can tell you things will happen that you may not know, but there's still order in it, yeah. Um, a chaotic system in my language is one with no effective constraints, which means it's actually quasi-random, which means it's only a temporary state. It ne never lasts for long, yeah. And then complexity, probably the best definition about complexity is it's an entangled system. Again, Alicia Jara has got this wonderful phrase, um, like bramble bushes in a thicket which is a great image, right? And everything is entangled with everything else and you pull one thing and you don't know what will happen. The only thing you know with absolute certainty is any intervention will have unintended consequences. And that has ethical consequences for government, by the way, because once you know that, you're responsible for it. Now, those three states have phase shifts between them. So a metaphor for this is solid, liquid and gas. Um, so if I heat water to 100 degrees, it doesn't become steam until I put more heat in. That's latent heat. Yeah, that's the phase shift. So those order, complex and chaos have energy gradients between them in which they do a phase shift change. So it's not a gradation. Yeah? Um, and of course, there's a thing in this called the triple point, which is a balance in between pressure and temperature, which means it's equiprobable whether something would become solid, liquid or gas. In Kinevin, that's called the apparatic domain. I'm quite proud of that, actually. I've got a phrase from Derrida into common use in business. And it's not many people can claim that. And Derrida famously said, if you know the answer to a question, it's not a question, it's a process. The only valid question is the one to which you do not know answers. So that's an aporia or an apparatic state. That's the central domain of Kinevin. And it means from here we could go in any direction, but we have to hold our belief. In fact, we have a whole typology of aporia now, both physical, artistic, linguistic types of aporia to create that state. So that's the kind of like basic Kinevian framework, which we call three plus one. You can then separate um, order into two, where the relationship between cause and effect is clear and where the relationship between cause and effect is complicated. So that's the difference between driving on the left and an expert telling you what's happening to your engine if it goes wrong. Yeah, so, but they're both types of order. And then finally, when you get really advanced, Kinevin has a liminal, liminal states, which is one more line on the framework. And that the liminality is this anthropological concept of a state of suspended transition, which is a key concept in Kinevin. So basically you have a liminal domain between complex and complicated where things are becoming structured, becoming ordered, becoming predictable, but not that quite, not quite there yet. Huge amount of software development methods like Scrum, for example, sit in that domain. They're, they're linear iteration, to the degree of uncertainty. You then got this really interesting liminal area in complicated, which is where experts disagree. Uh, so we had that in COVID, you know, behavioral scientists didn't agree with epidemiologists and so on. And one of the things we developed over the years is a method called the tri trioptican, um, which is a sort of highly structured dance between experts, which the decision maker can observe, yeah, so that they can resolve things there. Um, then you get this sort of liminal area between complex and chaos, which is in chaos, and that's where you use chaos deliberately. So that's where, for example, we use wisdom of crowds. 
So if lots of independent agents assess something independently of each other, so that's deterministic chaos, you can trust the result. So we use whole of workforce engagement there. And then you get this split in the central domain, apparatic becomes either apparatic, which is fine, or confused, which is a bad idea. So I've, the nice thing about Kinevin, it originally started as a two by two and then it developed. It's, it was 21 years old last year in its five domain format. But the thing with Kinevin is it's evolved over time as more theory has come in, more practice has come in. Yeah, it's changed. Um, there's a big change coming where we're going to change constraints to scaffolding, which I'll announce shortly, right? And there are reasons for that. And I think that's why it survived and had the longer the impact it's had, because it's adjusted and changed. It wasn't a one-time framework based on a one-time study. It emerged in this, this lovely intersection between theory and practice. Yeah, and you mentioned COVID, and I think maybe we can use that as an example to make it a little bit more relevant. Uh, to a real world example, because the sense that that I, I've had and I think many people have had with COVID is that it's been a real stress test of the system. And one of the issues that it seems to have shown up is that centralized top down solutions to a rapidly evolving complex problem seem to create problems further down the, the line. Uh, I'd say yes and no. And I think yeah, what that question illustrates another one of these big complexity differences. We always talk about context sensitivity, not context, context independent. Mm. So nobody who understands complexity will ever make an absolute statement mm. because in different contexts, different things work. Right? So if we take COVID, it's actually a good example of that. And I actually wrote um, the European Union field guide on managing in complexity and chaos, which has just come out in paper form. Yeah. Um, that was with Alessandra who did the design and did the editing. So that was, that's a good book and it talks through the whole process. Now, if you look at that, it says there are basically four stages in the way you manage something like COVID. Yeah. Um, assess, adapt, exact, transcend. So I'll just run through those quickly at a high level. So the assess one is kind of like, are we really in a crisis or not? I mean, you may not be, right? If you've got contingency plans, if you've got all of that stuff worked out, that's not a crisis. Yeah, that's actually probably complicated because you know what to do, go do it. If you are genuinely in a crisis, or you haven't planned for this, it was unexpected, or you planned for it, but you didn't really believe it would happen, so you let the plans lapse, which is what happened in the UK, then you're in a crisis. And that's the only time you do heavyweight top-down management. Uh, the way we say it is you impose draconian constraints, you're in chaos, you impose draconian constraints to shift it into that apparatic domain. And the essence of draconian decision making is to keep your options open not to solve the problem. So for example, the New Zealand Prime Minister did that really well. She actually broke her own law, but she closed New Zealand down. And she's had much more options as a result. Whereas Britain, Sweden and the UK waited in, you know, and the US waited until they had no alternative. And then they finally did it. By that time, their options were severely limited and a lot of people died unnecessarily. Once you've done that, you've got it into an apparatic domain. And then the rule is very simple. You centralize coordination, you distribute decision making. And that's a generic principle. And I mean, I've been sea level a lot of my life, right? The higher you get up an organization, the more you only re meet angrier and angrier customers. And the more you realize you can't make any decisions anyway, because you just don't know enough, right? So that's where we get into what's called the apparatic turn in Kinevin. So now we're into adapt. And that's kind of like, well, what's complicated? I, which experts did we ignore? Okay, give them resources, get them to solve those problems. Yeah. Do we have conflict between experts? You run a trioptic and over 24 hours, you decide what you're going to do in what parts. You've got complex, so you've got multiple hypotheses. This, by the way, is a definition of complexity. If you have multiple competing hypotheses, all of which are supported by the evidence, all of which are coherent, and you can't resolve which is right within the time frame from decision, then it's complex. So instead of trying to resolve it, you actually run a safe to fail experiment for every coherent hypothesis and see what happens to the change. It's technically a probe, not an experiment, because it will change the space. And if you haven't got hypotheses or you don't think you've got enough, that's when we move into that liminarity of chaos. We use a sensor network to get multiple perspectives. So that's kind of like that build, right? Um, we then have three things that you need to do. Uh, and you should have done these before the crisis. If you haven't done them, you have to pedal fast. Uh, 
One is you need dense informal networks. So informal networks in organizations, the, the metaphor for this is the fungal roots that connect tree roots, without which a soil isn't healthy. And nobody can trace the fungal roots because they're fine grained and they're all over the place. So I've talked with a lot of executives and the thing which mattered to them during COVID is they fell back to their informal networks, not their formal system. And there's a scientific reason for that in the informal networks are context-free information channels, whereas formal systems are context-specific information channels, so they're less adaptive yeah, if, they, if they haven't been predicted. And there's an interesting difference here between Singapore, for example, which is where I've done a lot of work and they initially funded, funded us, um, where everybody is in an informal network based on the fact they did military service together. So it's quite democratic. Whereas in Britain, the informal networks are based on a couple of private schools and a couple of universities. And so they're quite perverted. So one of the things you do, and there's techniques like entangled trios and social network stimulation, you want to build informal networks across silos so that you, you want everybody within three or four degrees of separation of everybody else. And that can be done quite quickly. Yeah, so that's a resilience measure. You need to map what you know at the right level of granularity. This links in with the third stage, which is EXCEPT. Now that's a concept from evolutionary biology. Uh, Gould was the guy who originated it. So it's where a trait which evolved for one function under stress accepts it doesn't adapt for something completely different. So dinosaurs' wings, for example, actually the feathers originally evolved for warmth and sexual display. Then there was a small, fast-running dinosaur which developed skin flaps under its forelimbs, and when it was running to escape bigger dinosaurs, it took off. That's how we get flight. It's an accident. Yeah? Uh, the cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved to manipulate muscles in fingers. It exapts in humans to manage grammar in language. So the step to grammar is too big a step for a linear process. It requires a non-linear acceptation. Microwave ovens we have because somebody noticed a chocolate bar melted in their pocket when, we, when he was maintaining the magneto of a radar machine. Uh, Brian Arthur has written a lot about this. The, the innovation in humans generally is acceptive, not original. And we call it in the U handbook radical repurposing. So one of the things we do is you, if you actually store what you know at the right level of granularity, you can combine it with previously unarticulated needs to suggest acceptive links. And that's critical for innovation in general, but critical in a crisis. And then the third thing you need to do is to build your sensor networks. Um, give you a bit of basic science on this. So if you give a radio radiologist a patch of x-rays and you ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla in plain view, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, on average 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83% who didn't. Now the reason for this is you only scan 3 to 5% available data. That then triggers a series of body, brain and social memories. It's not just the brain. You, they're fragmented, they're messy. You then blend them together to come up with a pattern. And the minute you get a pattern which appears to affect you apply. You, what you satisfy is you don't optimize. And in evolutionary terms, that makes a lot of sense. You know, the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow runs towards you at high speed. You don't want to artistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and then look up best practice case studies on how to avoid lions. You know, by that time, the book of Jonah from the Old Testament will have utility because it's the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore you know, written by a survivor. So we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan and privilege in our most recent experience. So what we do is we convert the whole of your workforce or your customers or your population, this comes from the counterterrorism work I did in Washington, as a human sensor network so they can all independently assess a situation and give you real-time maps which show dominant views, minority views and outliers. So those are three key components and only then do you move into transcend. And the trouble with most organizational change, it starts with a transformation objective and it doesn't realize transformation is only ever an emergent property of other things you do. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but... Um. Yeah, I just wonder whether there 
using COVID as a case study, um, using your framework to kind of evaluate what you think governments have done right, what governments have done wrong, what would would there have been a different process involved? If, yeah, there were, and we've we've actually just put together an assessment process by which a government or a company can actually go through against the field guide and assess what they did. And that interestingly has three sort of criteria. One is, yeah, we did this, but we don't do it that way again. So we need to think about how we would do it the next time. So, for example, in the NHS, they set up um, Facebook groups to share medical knowledge, and now they're in deep trouble on, yeah, data security and everything else, so they can't do it that way again. But the principle was good. Yeah? Um, there's then things that we worked out which we can continue, we just need to codify them and train people, and there's things where we completely messed up. So what we do is we sort of map that against what you actually did, and then there's a whole body of methods and tools which, okay, start to experiment with these, see if they work. And I think the key thing which has come out of COVID, it's now a lot easier to talk to people about the difference between resilience and robustness. Um, so that I always make, I always say, you know, robustness is like a seawall. It keeps the sea out until it breaks and then you wish you hadn't built it. Whereas a salt marsh absorbs the sea and even if it fills up, doesn't break catastrophically. So a resilient system survives with continuity of identity over time. And by the way, that incorporates Taleb's anti-fragile which is not a very effective way of becoming resilient, to be honest. Yeah? Um, it's always been in the literature under resilience anyway. And you're starting to say to organizations, resilient systems actually are inefficient. And for the last 30 years, you've focused on efficiency. So you've reduced resilience in consequence. So you need to start to build redundancy and variety into the system. Yeah? And there's a body of tools around that. So I think, yes, and I, I said, Famously, when COVID hit, you know, it's God's gift to humanity because it's a containable crisis compared with what's going to come afterwards. I mean, first of all, it's permanent. We're not going to get rid of it. Secondly, there are much more nasty things coming out of the tundra in Siberia, which is defrosting, which we have no immune system to handle, and antibiotics are losing value. And then we've got global warming. So COVID is a chance to sort ourselves out. Mm. So COVID is a kind of stress test of the system that we can learn from rather than... Yeah, I, and I say the God's gift to humanity is kind of like it's a bit cruel, but it's sort of, here it is. You, you've now proved you don't have to travel so much. You, you proved that you can actually do lockdowns. You proved that you can actually behave socially in better ways. You've also proved that people are still evil and you can't just assume everybody will be good. And yeah, corruption exists. I feel in Britain I'm living in a banana republic at the moment, given the level of government corruption. But all of those sort of things, yeah, gives you a chance to sort of rehearse, pretend, and build systems which have that sort of long-term continuity. And when it comes to sense making, what, what are the different strategies for the different um, states that, that have covered in the in the framework? Okay, so if it's clear, which you know, order divides into clear and complicated. If it's clear, you sense, categorize, respond. Yeah, it's fairly simple. It's a taxonomy. It's kind of like, okay, I'm in, I'm in this country, what class of country it is, oh, they drive on the left, I'll do that. So that's fairly simple. Yeah? And there's a lot in organizations which fits in that domain. Right? The danger is if you apply that when you shouldn't, then, I mean, the border between clear and chaos in Kinevin is drawn as a cliff, you fall over it. And most companies collapse because they assume too much order. Yeah, they, get, they get complacent. It's what... Um, Clayton Christiansen, who I had the privilege of working with briefly, called competence-induced failure. You don't fail because you're incompetent, you fail because you're too competent at the paradigm which is now out of date. And so that's that break. Complicated, you sense analyze respond. You know, the analysis may actually be bringing in experts who already know, but that's the process, all right? In both those domains, there is a right answer. In complex, as we've already discussed, you do parallel safe-to-fail probes. The parallel is the thing everybody forgets. It's, it's like pilot projects always work. It's called the Hawthorne effect. If you do something novel, it always works. It doesn't mean it will work again, all right? So you do the parallel probes, and in chaos, you act sense respond. You act decisively to open up the options. So, and notice that in complex and chaos, there's nothing between sense and respond. Yeah, because you just don't have the time to do that. And when it comes to sense making, what do you think are the um, 
the most common mistakes or the most common things that people should know and don't? Um, I think there's several. One is over-reliance on black box AI. I mean, the whole move to digitization is deeply problematic at the moment. Um, partly because nobody's paying attention to the training data sets. I remember at a conference in Washington 20 years ago when I was starting the DARPA work. And I was sat on a platform with John Poindexter, who used to be Reagan's national security advisor. Um, I didn't know who he was until I decided I liked him. Then I discovered who he was and I wasn't meant to like him, so that could have been confused for a bit. And somebody asked us what we thought about AI. And this is 20 years ago. And this, we were heavily working on counterterrorism. This is all around 9-11. And both of us said the problem is the training data sets. Um, and I'd worked on AI for years before that. Now, nobody believed us, but if you now look at the Scholastic Parrots paper from the Google employees, everybody understands that's an issue. So there's a body of sense making, which is about data analytics, which actually doesn't pay sufficient attention yeah, um, to training data sets and also over relies on written text, which is about 10% of what humans know anyway. So I think that's one problem. I think the other problem is where people do too much on the inductive case-based side. So about 99% of management textbooks are very similar. I studied these eight, 10, 15 companies over one, two, three, four, five months. I observed they all have this quality which you think is desirable and they all did these things. Therefore, if you do these things, you too will have the desirable property. That's called the confusion of correlation with causation. Yeah. And you, sometimes that's legitimate. So, for example, Good to Great, which is a major textbook. Yeah? But if you look at it, I remember the first time I read it, and I said, but you've chosen the apex predators. So you've chosen companies who are the first to establish a market. Well, they survive no matter how incompetent they are. So there's a much simpler explanation if you understand ecological life systems. And then you get some really bad books. So there's one called Lean Startup where the guy goes and studies or interviews a series of people he knows who ran successful Silicon Valley startups and identify things they do, publishes a best-selling book. Well, when I was in IBM, we did a similar study with Dorothy Leonard at Harvard, and we found that all companies who failed did the same things as the company who succeeded. It's just you had a market, so some people are bound to fail, and some people are bound to succeed. So that's another bad book, and probably the worst of all time is LaCroix is reinventing the organization. Yeah, where he's actually got a, a religious fervor around the style of organization he would like. I mean, he also gets into the spiral dynamics nonsense. Um, he said he has jade because everybody in spiral dynamics has to have a new color so they can do it that way. And he only selects partial evidence from his own cases to support the proposition. Yeah? And that sort of thing in management books is really dangerous. It's really bad science and it's really dangerous for companies. Mm. Yeah, I was going to come to your attitude to developmental thinking. Um, you mentioned, um, is it Philippe LeCroux, the author of that book, Reinventing yeah. Organizations? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people who were heavily influenced by that, who tried to kind of use some of the lessons in their mm -hmm. company and generally weren't successful, it yeah. didn't, didn't work. Um, so yeah, broadly speaking, developmental thinking, we're talking kind of spiral dynamics, um, Ken Wilber's work, and I know a lot of people have tried to apply it to kind of businesses and, and failed. And I know you're quite sceptical about the whole idea of developmental I'm thinking. Actually, fairly antagonistic, to be honest. I think it's, I think it's morally dubious. I mean, Nora Bateson and I are having a lot of fun on social media on this at the moment. We're both going for it, um, which people didn't expect, right? So I think there are several things. First of all, you've got legitimate ends and non-legitimate ends. But if you go back to adult maturity bottles and things like Keegan, Again, that goes back to original research from Piaget, which has been disproved. People have tried to replicate the experiments and not got the same results. And that's a real problem with a lot of this stuff, certainly the psychological approaches. And the idea that you, you know, you, children go through stages, we can measure maturity. There are issues about brain plasticity, there are things like that. But you can't take that sort of physical development and then apply it to people's social ability. Um, I'm quite interested in taking Kagan's stages and making them modulators in a complex system. I, they will have different influences in different contexts, and then that, I think, is quite powerful, right? Um, but the step stuff, consultants like that too much because it privileges the person. There's almost this weird thing is, I've got a maturity model, that means I'm mature and you're not, and I'll take you through. At the extreme, that's where spiral dynamics went. Yeah, now if you look at spiral dynamics, the original research is very culturally specific. Mm 
And the guy did it on his own students in a very limited, unstructured way. So you can't from that generalize to a world pattern, all right? Um, it then gets picked up by Beck and Cohen, all right? And Cohen probably more authentic than Beck. Beck is a, you know, Beck ends up with Wilbur and John from Arlington Institute and the Turquoise Institute. Sorry, I know this stuff backwards, all right? And they then create this highly progressive things in which you are at different stages, all right? And I still remember when they created the Turquoise Institute, I got, um, I was at an event, shall we say, and I got told that I couldn't possibly discuss it with them because I was an angry green and I hadn't reached the turquoise state of enlightenment. So I had badges made that night, proud to be brown, and got everybody to wear them. And of course, brown isn't a colour, and they didn't get it, so they had no ironic sense of humour. Um, I think there are two or three dangers here. One is techniques which come sideways from therapy are always dangerous in organisations because they assume people need therapy and they privilege the therapist. And stage-based models are even more dangerous because they privilege an imagined future state. And they don't realise that in different contexts we can all be play different things. So if you take the tennis at the moment, we've got an 18-year-old displaying more maturity than most adults in the context of tennis, but that wouldn't mean I trust her with a nuclear weapon. You know, it's, it's this context-free thing which is, which is another problem with it. Mm. And you mentioned Keegan, um, so Robert Keegan from, from Harvard, he's got a sort of uh, a stage model as well. Are you saying that you don't think there's any underlying phenomena that they're picking up, or you just think it's dangerous? No, I'm actually it's saying at that end, I think that's interesting. I just think it's not, it's not linear. So I, I'm playing around with using his, his stages, not as stages, but as modulators. So modulators is a complexity concept. The way I describe it is you've got magnets, yeah, which can change in polarity and strength, and then you've got iron disks in the dirt table. So if all the magnets keep the same polarity and strength, stable pattern, if they all change, the patterns are unstable. So in different contexts, it will work. So I think the Keegan stuff has got research behind it. It's got this fundamental flaw and it's based on Piaget, who's been challenged significantly, but there's still value in it. Um, so I can do something with that, right? Um, but treating it as modulators. Spiral dynamics, after Wilbur got involved, became a cult. And it's an esoteric cult and it's a, I call it faux Buddhism. Um, and I think that's just dangerous. So are you saying that you don't think there are any underlying phenomena that models like Keegan's are pointing to? Or you, is, it, is it the way that they're used or you just don't think that it's... it's I don't think it's right and the way it's used is generally bad, right? So I think adults, I mean, it, 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 the, the trouble is they're taking a metaphor from physical growth stages and assuming that applies, yeah? It's like Dawkins makes this ridiculous metaphor between memes and genes. And gene isn't the primary unit anyway. I mean, no geneticist would support that. The danger is we take the physical context where we can see something and assume that applies everywhere where it doesn't, right? And it's also linked in with this highly social atomistic, this focus on the individual, which is a Northern European, North American characteristic, and what we call a Cartesian model of consciousness. So the assumption that the brain directs the body. Yeah. Now, actually, most of our decisions are made by our body, not by our brain, and by our social interactions. I mean, this is where we've done work with Deleuze and assemblage theory. Yeah, that creates a construct which we can't escape. Yeah. So it's a lot more messy, it's a lot more context-based, and it's a lot more flexible, and linear models actually are really poor as a representation of that. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned um, that a lot of our thinking and our working is kind of embodied. And I know you, you often work with people walking, for example, mm. maybe get, getting their bodies involved. And it reminded me a little bit of um, John Vivekey's work. And he talks about 4E cognitive science and says that within cognitive science now, the, the Cartesian split is, has gone. Like oh, they're, yeah. they're, they're completely, the, the idea is we are completely participatory. Are you familiar with, with the 4E cognitive science model? Do you think it's useful? Yes, and I think it's interesting, all right? I think Andy Clark is actually more interesting, if you want to look at this. But there's a whole body of stuff on that. I think everybody needs to realise as well that the reason Descartes created the separation of the mind and the body was to create, was to make sure he wasn't burnt alive for heresy. Because it created a space for the church and a space for science. I mean, Mary Midgley pointed that out years ago from the great British philosophers. So I think, yes, it's unnatural. I mean, if you look at autonomic novelty receptive processing, I mean, this is the one where you kill the free will. So people say, you know, if you pull your hand away from a hot plate, your brain fires afterwards, therefore you haven't got free will. Well, that's ridiculous. 
The point is, your brain is fine afterwards to check if it got the automatic response right or not this time. Yeah, it's only if you believe the brain has to direct things you make that mistake. Clark's work on scaffolding, which links in with the Fourier stuff, basically, and we've been doing work with him on our work on narrative, is that narrative constructs are also part of extended consciousness. So consciousness, and this is my point about systems with boundaries, a human being's consciousness is not boundaried. It's multi tendriled and multi interacted And we know, and the physicality is key. I'll give a personal example. I, um, two things, all right? I've had two near-fatal injuries, all right? So when I got type 2 diabetes, my own fault, I left IBM, I ate too much, was grossly overweight. You arrive at a hotel in New York at late at night and you just have the burger and chips, right? So I got a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, which was a shock. I was lucky I knew you could reverse it, yeah? And you reverse it through starvation and exercise. So I dropped 35 kilograms in four months, which took a lot of doing, all right? All of a sudden I'm walking and riding again and I'm actually thinking clearer. I mean, and because that physicality is part of it. If we want to resolve tension with somebody in the company, we go out for a walk together, yeah, in the same way. And yeah, the second thing is when I got a massive brain bleed. That was really interesting. Because I woke up one morning and went down to the computer and I couldn't type. Just couldn't coordinate. And I foolishly carried on for two weeks and drove around the country and ran workshops. By the end of it, I couldn't even write coherently. So I eventually gave in. You know? Went in, they thought it was a stroke, I was depressed, went back to the pub. Fortunately, he didn't take the tablets because this frantic phone call came in and said, you haven't taken the blood thinners, have you? And I said, no, and got hiked into the Radford because they'd found this massive brain bleed. So I got two holes drilled in my skull, and you can still see the scars there, right? Um, and I still remember waking up after the operation, and all of a sudden, I could just think clearly. And it's also been really useful living near Avebury, by the way, because it means I've been trade-panned, and that's an 8,000-year-old operation for shamans. So I've dined out on it ever since, all right? I have the third eye. But I think we, de we misunderstand the nature of the physicality, and it is also a major problem with IT programmers, because they don't get that physical interaction. Yeah, and that impacts things on things like ethical judgments and moral judgments. Can you say more about that? How do you, how do we how do we bring more? Oh, okay, so there was the a process? there was a famous case where a young kid um, actually fooled a whole set of people to believe he was trapped under a bed in the Hawaii earthquake, and he didn't understand he did anything wrong. He just thought it was a game, just didn't understand it. Um, and we had an interesting newspaper report in Marlborough the other day. So somebody in Swindon had called out the police because kids had drawn chalk on the pavement to play hopscotch and they called out the police because the kids were vandalizing it. Yeah, and it was kind of like, do you want to spend all your time in home on a computer? We know this is epigenetics, all right? We know that environment triggers genetic changes. So if you spend your key formative years on a screen, the autism gene is far more likely to be activated than it isn't, yeah? Um, yeah, epigenetics is fascinating, right? I mean, Eva Jablonka's work is brilliant there. So I think we, we, we don't have that complete self type concept. The danger is that you get into sort of new age mysticism when you start to talk about this, which we need to avoid. We need the scientific discourse around it in terms of the way it works. What heuristics do you think are beneficial for people in, to, to make in, in, the, in the sphere of sense making? Um, I've developed a whole load over the years. I mean, one of those is hindsight isn't foresight. Yeah, that, that's a good trigger mechanism. Um, knowledge is only ever volunteered. It can't be conscripted. We always know more than we can tell. We can always tell more than we can write down. There's a whole body of general, there are more aphorisms than heuristics. Heuristic development is actually something we do for companies. You, you gather their stories, you identify the heuristics people are making for decision making. You then consolidate and make them memorable and attach them to teaching stories. And that provides a better governance mechanism than rules if the world is complex. So we have this sort of, if it's ordered, you have rules. If it's complex, you have heuristics. So give you two examples. The US Marines, this is work that Klein originally did. Um, if the battlefield plan breaks down, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. Yeah? And if you do that and you fail, that's okay. Now notice they're measurable. Heuristics are never, we will be customer orientated. That's called a platitude. They're measurable. Yeah, so that, that's fascinating. We do work in safety. We did it with Boeing and the like. 
where we basically created heuristics for when rules can be broken. So if these applies and somebody with this experience signs it off, you can break any rule provided you document it this way. And you follow these two or three principles. Yeah, so sorry, favorite story of mine, right? So when my daughter was very young, um, I carried her up to the top of Conwy Castle in North Wales. Uh, her mother and her baby brother stayed down because they have a fear of heights, all right? And we were a bit naughty. And I had her on a harness, but she'd almost run off the Irish ferry the week before, right? So I had a harness on her with a dog lead, extendable dog lead, which my wife didn't approve of, but I think is very good for toddlers, right? So we get to the top of the castle and we hang over the top and wave to mother below just to scare the living daylights out of her, yeah? And then she dropped her fluffy toy rabbit while she was over, it drops down 20 feet, lands on a ledge. Now I'm now in deep trouble, all right? This is the rabbit without which we cannot sleep at nights, all right? Um, which means I'll be the one who gets punished for this and knowing my family that assemble on my deathbed to remind me of the day I did this, all right? So I was then a climber, all right? So I tied her to the flagpole in the castle so she couldn't get away. Yeah, went over the side, climbed down, because castle walls from a climber's point of view are nothing, all right? got the rabbit, climbed back up, handed it over, got a nice hug, um, went down to meet the police. The Conway police were really excited because they'd finally had a crime. They don't get many crimes in Conway, so I got taken to the police station. And then they realized what I'd done and we had tea and coffee and they played with Eleanor. And then I realized we'd left my wife in the middle of the castle for two hours. So it, it got difficult, right? But when I climbed back up, I suddenly started to say to myself, three points of contact, three points of contact, three points of contact, because that gets drummed into you when you learn to climb. And after you've learned it, you often don't do it. Sometimes you're hanging by one finger, but I've got no protection, I'm not properly equipped, three points of contact. That's how heuristics work. They can drive into people's memory. Mm. And we touched at the beginning about the history of, of sense making. Um, it's obviously become a lot more, we're hearing a lot more people use that term now. And are you pleased that it, that it is becoming more well known or do you think it's not? No, I, I think it's, it's good news. And I think it's good news. I mean, Oxford recently published a summary of the five different schools, right? So you've got Carl Weick is the great granddaddy of all of this, right? And he's the classic sort of American normative study what companies done, draw conclusions from that. And some are good, some are bad, right? I mean, I, I, he has a tendency towards context independence particularly when he writes with Sutcliffe. You've got a whole bunch of people in data processing. That's where I came from originally, right? Yeah, data analytics, loose on information theory. Yeah, we're using early stage computers to actually understand and present data in different ways so that human beings can make sense. And that tradition still exists. You've got Gary Klein, um, who's a really good friend, um, who was the first to identify that people make decisions based on pattern recognition, not on structured processes. His original book is brilliant. His latest stuff on shadow boxing is excellent. And then you've got Brenda Dervin, who's fascinating. I mean, she cured herself of what was meant to be an incurable cancer. She's a wonderfully eccentric woman. Um, and she comes from postmodernism and library science. And then you've got me. So those are kind of like five recognized schools. And we're seeing the same in complexity. So we now make a distinction between computational complexity and anthro complexity. Yeah, anthro complexity is complexity in humans who have intelligence, identity, and intention, yeah? And when a field starts to create different schools, it's starting to mature, yeah? And that, that's why, for example, I really object when people subsume all of this under the general title of systems thinking, because that's meaningless. And in the popular imagination, systems thinking means systems dynamics, that's Senge's fault. And is there much of an overlap with the rationalist community? I mean, they talk a lot about cognitive bias and, and the way that you um, kind of mistake the There world. isn't, there isn't, all right. So, I mean, Klein has said, and I will say, that there's no such thing as a cognitive bias. There are cognitive heuristics. And they actually, overall, in evolutionary terms, all have major advantages. So we should stop thinking about them as biases. Yeah? Um, I mean, I'm a materialist and a rationalist, all right? But that doesn't... The concept that human beings make rational decisions is a very quaint post-enlightenment European concept, which actually doesn't apply, right? So it's, and it, it leads to this fundamental mistake in sense making. If you give the right people the right information and they have the right training, they'll make the right decision. And that's not the case, right? It's the big mistake people make with people like Trump or Brexit, all right? They try and argue rationally against what is called a, in narrative theory, a trope or in Deleuzean epistemology and assemblage or in complexity a strange attractor. 
It's a pattern of belief which is actually formed based with knowledge of the rational arguments against it and it can sustain itself against them. Yeah, so I don't believe in that type of rationality but I am a materialist. I, yeah, I think social constructivism and critical realism were bad stages. I mean critical realism arose in response to social constructivism and still defines itself that way. I think to be honest we, we can move on from that now. The science is a lot better. So do you think that we may consciously know that we're not rational agents, but we still, whenever we construct a model of the world, make, bring, bring those kinds of... Some cultures do. I mean, it's interesting. I'm about to do um, a series of dialogues with indigenous leaders, first with the author of Santo, which is coming yeah. up. Yeah? And I did a lot of my early work in knowledge management in Kakadu in near Darwin in Australia back in the 70s, when, to be quite honest, it was genocide. I remember seeing an Aboriginal activist literally murdered in front of me by my security guard. And the police said it's only an ABO and wouldn't do anything about it. So it was difficult, right? But there's a key distinction. If There's this tradition which grew up post-enlightenment in Northern Europe, North America. I keep saying that rather than West because it's not true of the Celtic fringe. It's not true of Southern Europe, right? Um, of the way we solve problems is we sit down and talk about them, decide where we want to be, and then we close the gap. And that's an almost universal. Yeah. Um, our approach, which is also an indigenous approach, is you do some things together and then you have the conversation. So, for example, I was working on peace and reconciliation in Ireland in the 70s. At yeah. um, that time I was going to be a Jesuit. But that didn't work out. I failed the test of obedience, all right? um, which has been the story of my life, to be honest. Um, and I say, I mean, it was bad in those days. I was walking down the Falls Road once and I got picked up by a police Land Rover and asked which of my legs did I want broken first. Yeah, and then I heard my accent and realized I was from mainland, so they threw me out of the Land Rover. If I'd been Irish, yeah. And to be quite honest, if the Provo commander had come around that night, it'd have probably joined. Yeah. And it was that level of distress. Right? Now you then got attempts to reconcile that. So Corimila claimed a huge amount of success, yeah, because it got everybody together, they all agreed they're nice to be other, they all stopped throwing petrol bombs. Something which was brilliantly satirized in episode one of series two of Derry Girls, where the Catholic girls are brought into a peace and reconciliation process with Protestant boys. It's one of the most funniest episodes ever, particularly if you're around at the time. We took a different approach. We took people from both communities and dumped them into Latin America for six months, and we didn't talk about the troubles. Yeah, effectively, they did things together, and the conversation could occur naturally. Now, that's one of the big things organizational change consultants help, hate because it means they don't mediate the conversation. We're doing the same on peace and reconciliation post-election in the States. And this desire of consultants to be the mediator, the interpreter, the coach is a real problem. Yeah, can you talk more about that? I know you talked about sort of like the white savior complex that a yeah. lot of these kind of in interventions bring about. Well, part of it is what I talked about earlier. It's, it's bringing things sideways in therapy. Yeah. And I know this is controversial, but I've never liked the Tavistock Institute. I think it was born to be manipulative and it stayed manipulative ever since. Right? And I think it's time for us to move away from Jung and Freud. I mean, they were really progressive in their time, but we know so much more now. It's the wrong framing, yeah, particularly when you get into the hero's journey nonsense. Right? So I think the danger is that a lot of facilitation techniques do come sideways from therapy. Yeah, appreciative inquiry is another one. Right? And all of those privilege the therapist and imply that people need help. That's the same problem with spiral dynamics. You haven't reached my state of enlightenment. Yeah? And I think that's deeply problematic. I mean, when I did most of the, our method development when I was in IBM, I did it in Denmark so I could facilitate in English, but they would speak in Danish, so I couldn't get involved in the content. And it all became a matter of managing a process or a dance so that people could find meaning for themselves and create their own direction. And I think that's what facilitation should be about. But the problem is the minute you take the coach role, the counsel role, the therapist role, you're looking for evidence to support your therape therapeutic theory. Yeah, and that's the trouble. You will then find it, you'll auto suggest it, and you can end up with people getting quite distressed as a result. And you've also talked about the, that you disagree that we're in a post-truth yeah. environment. We've never been in a truth-based environment, ever. I mean, anybody said the classics know that. You know, read, read Cicero, mm. all right? I mean, but, but Cicero and Caesar is anybody with Trump. It's the same story. Mm. Is the, I mean, one of the other 
kind of frameworks that you can look at it is that, okay, we're not any more in, in a more sort of post-truth world, but we are in a world that we can't trust the institutions as much. Okay, so there are several things, all right? One is the scaffolding has changed, all right? So it used to be people trusted experts. Yeah, really from the end of the Second World War. Yeah, and before that it didn't matter because not many people had to get involved. And kind of like that didn't pan out so well, so we're trying demagogues instead for a change. My, my point is we always hand over a lot of our information process into third parties or to institutions of various types. Yeah? And that's problematic because if, you, if trust breaks down in the system, people will go to whatever they think is convenient. And just to write a blog post on this because I found somebody who's actually quite left-wing who's running conspiracy theories about Wikipedia. And the guy got thrown out of Wikipedia in 2008 because he was an arrogant academic who thought he had more rights than other editors. And since then, it's all conspiracy theory. So we do have this tendency to do that, right? And I think that's where, we, that's where I find Deleuze really useful. So we talk about you know, that pattern of narrative which you get sucked into. And that forms an interpretive framing for the way you see the problem. So it acts as a filtering device. Yeah? So it reinforces. Deleuze came up with this really interesting concept called lines of flight. So how do you find the weaknesses in the assemblage theory, which means you can escape those lines of flight? So the work we're doing in the States at the moment on this post-election peace and conflict in stage two, we'll use children as ethnographers to gather stories about local conditions. We'll find common issues or problems which apply to both red and blue politics and then get people from both backgrounds to work on those problems. We won't talk about the political divide. That's the same as the reconciliation stuff. You allow the conversation to emerge through action. And that, the assemblage can't escape. Yeah, that, that's a line of flight because people start to see people through a different lens. I have a lot of arguments with Boston Brahmins about this because they think the way to do that is for all these people to come into a workshop and they'll explain to them how, you know, if they would only adopt the cultural and attitudinal beliefs of white MIT lecturers, then the world would be a better place. And it might well be. But that's too culturally specific. You know, it's the problem with both Senghi and Sharmaga. You know, they're culturally very specific in terms of what they value and it ends up as a new form of neocolonialism. And you're familiar with the work of Joseph Henrik. The, he, he talks about how weird people, white um, Anglo-Saxon effectively, um, that we are, we've outsourced so much of our sense making and so much of our authority to institutions that we're actually different kinds of people. So the fact that these institutions are now failing is actually a, a much more And they're sure about that problem. because I think institutions have always been around. I think there is something distinctly Anglo-Saxon. Um, but I think actually that's Protestantism. Mm. So if you look at it, social atomism as a phenomenon, you know, and the classic comparison is social, at social atomism v. communitarianism. Yeah. And social atomism is the Protestant states because it's the emphasis on the individual. The individual has a relationship with God, society is an assembly of individuals, institutions are the same way, right? If you go into communitarian cultures, they also have institutions and they trust and don't trust them in similar ways. They're just different institutions. Yeah? We then got into the sort of techno specialists. We started to get consumed by the idea that a 19th century concept of science could solve all our problems. Yeah, and we still haven't updated on that. People who are pro or anti science are pro or anti 19th century. And yeah, they haven't got up to date on epigenetics, quantum mechanics, or anything. Mm. And what is the impact that your work has had on, on others? Well, Kenevin has been taken up. Um, I keep finding new ways of people. I'm quite proud of that because they haven't been trained, but they use it. The, the article I'm fondest of, it was used by the British Cabinet Office to explain the role of religion in the Bush White House, which is a published paper. Um, and we had a, a police SWAT squad in the States who actually drew it with a rusty nail on the back of a breeze block and decided the problem was complex, so they didn't follow standard operating procedures. They did probes and people's lives were saved. But critically, when they phoned up headquarters, they said it's complex, we're probing. They used Kinevin strategically as well as operationally, so they understood it. So there's lots of good cases like that. I think it's the essence of our approach to sense making is these micro impacts. It's like the problem with climate change. It needs to be a micro problem for people before it can be a macro problem for politicians. And we get those things the wrong way around. And what have we not talked about yet that we should do before we finish there? 
Uh, the latest stuff I'm doing is to take Deutsch's work on constructor theory, which came out of quantum mechanics, which is not the same thing as constructional law, which came from thermodynamics, which is very different. I'm less sure about that. That's a flow point. So the way constructor theory is the first attempt in physics to deal with a system as a whole rather than reduce it to the smallest possible particle and project forwards. I mean, I love quarks. I think quarks is a great idea. It's probably as far as you should go, but yeah. So the way constructor theory works is you start off by saying, what's the counterfactual situation? So what is physically impossible? And that defines your space. So you don't start with where I want to be. You start with what's not possible. Then you can say constructors, which isn't a term he invented, but he's developed it, which produce replicable outcome. So, and what the key thing here is whatever has the lowest energy gradient will win. Yeah. So we've now adapted that extensively. So we've taken our constraint mapping technique and our scaffolding concept from the work we did on alternatives to design thinking, which is terribly linear. And we're basically saying, well, you start off by mapping the constraints and the scaffolding in play, and that creates a counterfactual universe. You can then look at the constraints and say, could we change any of these at what risk? Because that would change the counterfactual space, and maybe not now, but maybe in six months' time. So there's a temporal aspect to that. And then you build constructors, and I've given you examples like you know, myths, structures, rules, whatever, you know, heuristics, and see if they replicate in parallel. And what you're overall doing is you want the energy cost of doing good things to be lower than the energy cost of doing bad things. And this is, I think, the mistake with all organizational development and society change the data. It hasn't listed energy cost. So it assumes if we want to do this the right thing and we advocate it enough and we explain it enough, people will do it. Actually, if the energy cost is higher, you won't do it. So I think that's, that to me is transformatory and that's the thing which really excites me at the moment. Mm. And where do you think, I mean, you've been working in this area, talking about complexity, working with organizations, working with governments. Where do you think that the conversation is at now? Do you think it's, it's, it's reached the point that, that, that most, most organizations and most authorities are aware of it? Or yeah, or and not? these things go in movements. So I mean, I developed this in a theory called Flexus Curves, which is a development of market life cycle theory. So if you look at scientific management, which persisted to the 80s, right, it got displaced by systems thinking. And most people who criticize scientific management are actually criticizing systems thinking. I taught leadership with Drucker and he made me learn this, right? In scientific management, actually they had management apprentice schemes and they had a lot of redundancy in the system. They automated the manual stuff, but the management stuff and the strategic stuff, and they didn't have three or five year plans. They had more adaptive systems. And then systems thinking came along with its engineering metaphor. I mean, if it had come from Checklin, not from Forrester, or rather from Senge's perversion of Forrester, it would have been different. Business process re-engineering Six Sigma. So the assumption is we remove human judgment from the system. And we've had that for about 30 years. It hasn't worked. You know, the soft side is learning organization, you know, all of those sort of things. The hard side is BPR. Um, and I'd argue most of the psychological techniques, the Freudian Jungian stuff, you know, psychodynamics actually fits within that framework. Privilege is the expert, privilege is structure, assumes context independent repeatability. Complexity is now in the same position systems thinking was in the 80s and 90s, and it went from esoteric idea to dominant theory over about five years. And we're seeing that with complexity, and the signs are there. So I get mobbed by a whole bunch of what I call cybernetics bully boys every now and then, on, because they suddenly realized cybernetics was a cool idea, but it's completely out of date. And they're losing business, I think. So they're basically coming and saying, You're, you know, we've been dealing with complexity for years, you're not doing anything different. And you explain very patiently, well, we, we, we used gravity before Newton came along, but now we've got a science and that changes it. Yeah? So all of a sudden, most of the people who've been making money and living out of systems thinking for the past 20 or 30 years are talking complexity. Complexity is in the language of people. Um, the EU handbook, I died, it's inconceivable I would have got to write a field guide for the whole of the European Union based on complexity theory before COVID. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, so I think we're at that growth, but it's why we're now talking more about sense making and less about complexity theory. Because the danger we don't want this to be another fad cycle. You know, throw out everything which went before and replace it with complexity. Because there's a lot of good stuff in systems thinking. There's a lot of good stuff in scientific management. And that was one of the original drivers for Kinevin. I was an executive. I just got fed up with every two years a different fad. And I kept saying, but 
the old stuff worked, it's just we took it too far. So why don't we work out the boundaries and do something differently on the other side? And that's what Kinevin is all about. And just how, how does um, talking about sense making avoid it becoming a fad? Oh, I think the key thing is you have to keep changing language. People don't get this. It's like I would ban the word holism or holistic because it's just become a terrible platitude. Right? It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's like we had to abandon the word knowledge management because it became information management and we changed it to decision support. So language mutates and changes over time. And to quote Heidegger, right, man thinks he's the master of language, language but language is the master of man. So language actually matters in terms of making distinctions and getting people to do the right sort of things. So my gut feel is complexity is just going to become something everybody talks about and they'll do agent-based modeling, they'll incorporate it in data analytics, McKinsey will st McKinsey's will start to write reports about it. And I want to escape that fad cycle, I'm trying to break that. And how long do you think we've got before everyone's really pissed off with sense-making as a term? And I, I think actually, I don't think so. I think, I think this is, scientific management lasted for about 50, 60 years. I mean, it, it, this is me getting into Hegel, right? It's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Yeah, business process re-engineering was an antithesis to the thesis of scientific management. It didn't really change things that much, but it said it was radically different. It's created a space for something new. So I think we've got a few decades. Dave, thank you very much. Real pleasure. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.